Hello, great to have you with us again. And today we're going to begin our services with just a little bit of fun. I hope that you enjoy it as we just sing about the power and the greatness of our Lord. All right? That would buy eternal life. 
Saturday before Easter 2020, I want to talk to you today about learning how to celebrate the moment. You see, as best we can, we have been attempting to do this online through these special online services. Well, if this were a typical year, churches throughout our world would be meeting together at various times for special services. Some churches might gather together or would have gathered together earlier in the week to have celebrated the fact of giving up something for Lent for the past 40 days. Other churches, like here at Mount Zion, would have planned a special service on Thursday to celebrate the Passover and the fulfillment and the institution of the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is such a significant part of our worship and our walk with Jesus Christ. I can understand why we celebrate its institution into our worship. But then there were others, and I really think that I was raised in this type of a background. There are others who would gather together and meet for a Good Friday service to celebrate the cross, to celebrate the perfect sacrifice. Whenever Jesus, as that sacrificial lamb, he went to the cross and died on that cross for our sins. <laughs> There is so much to celebrate about the cross. Our very lifeblood was tainted by sin. Jesus transformed our lives through absolutely the greatest blood transfusion ever. And he applied his blood to our lives to cleanse us. In 1 John 1 and 7, the scripture clearly states, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter what your social status is. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman or a boy or a girl. Jesus Christ went to the cross for you. And it was his blood that cleanses us from every sin. And so, two verses later, in that very same chapter, we read where John also writes that if we will confess our sins, God is faithful and he is just and he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now notice, we've been given the simple part. All we have to do is to confess. All we have to do is to admit. All we have to do is to believe that Jesus Christ was that perfect sacrifice. And if we will admit that, and if we will believe that, and if we will confess it to the Lord, asking forgiveness for our sins, and then if we will make it our aim and our attempt to walk in a newness of life, we are fit for heaven. What an incredible debt that our Lord Jesus paid on our behalf. Have you ever paid off an incredible debt? For some of you, maybe you made that last payment on your house. That mortgage that you've been carrying for 30 years is now gone. I remember how I was simply relieved to have my student loans paid off after I graduated college. Or do you remember that last installment, that last payment that you paid on your very first car? I can remember the first time that Kathy and I bought new furniture. You know, that was back in the days that we had to take out a loan. We didn't have any extra money. And for us, that little bitty loan was a very, very large loan. And in this particular loan, we paid all of the interest up front to the furniture store. That was our down payment. 
And then we paid $100 a month for 12 months. And in those days, that was lots of money. Well, on one of those months, Kathy had written the check. She had put it in the envelope. She had everything right there on the table. And she left for a moment to go and to get a stamp. Well, while she was gone, one of our children wanted to help Mommy out. So they brought in some Monopoly money and slid it into the envelope with the check. <laughs> Ironically, it was $700 worth of play money. And that was the exact amount of the principal that we still owed. About a week later, we received our Monopoly money back with this note. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Trotter, we so appreciate your faithful monthly payment and the eager way in which you try to settle your loan. However, it is our company policy that we cannot accept money made by the Milton Bradley Company. Therefore, we are returning it to you. Sincerely, Kentucky Finance Company. <laughs> Now, none of us would ever seriously try to settle a, date, a, a debt with fake money. Would we? No, it takes something real. It takes something authentic to settle a debt. We live in a world today in which people in our culture and people in our days and even people within the church of our day, they try to settle a debt by working it out for the Lord. They try to settle a debt by being faithful to their church attendance. They try to settle a debt by being just good enough. You see, they're only interested in being just good enough to get to heaven. But you know, that doesn't settle our debts. We do good works and we do good deeds and we act in faithfulness in response to what Jesus has done for us. He's the one that paid the debt. Every last penny of it, every last drop of blood. And so that's why we celebrate Good Friday. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 the Bible teaches us that Jesus was the authentic payment for our sins. He canceled the debt or he canceled the record that contained the charges that we had occurred because of our sins. Now he did this by nailing those sins. He did this by taking those debts and nailing them to the cross. And so with this having been said, I can understand why we celebrate Good Friday. I understand why we celebrate the cross. But what does this Saturday, the Saturday before Easter, what does it hold for us? <laughs> why is there a reason for you and I to celebrate on this Saturday before Easter. Well, some of you might say, well, the Bible does say this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And, and yes, that can be said of any day in the calendar year. But there was something special to this day. The day that was after Good Friday the day that was before the resurrection. And, and so what was it? Yeah. The disciples were having difficulty finding out what that was. Jesus was dead. And not only was Jesus dead, they had carried him to the tomb. They buried him. He was in the grave. In the 30th Psalm, in verse number 9, I want you to notice what the psalmist says. David is speaking to God. David says, what will you gain if I die? 
If I sink into the grave, can my dust praise you? Can it tell the world of your faithfulness? Oh, please listen to that verse again. David is praying to God. And he says, what will you gain if I die? What will you gain, God, if I sink into the grave? Can my dust praise you? Can it tell the world of your faithfulness? I can assure you that the disciples were not celebrating on this particular Saturday. I can assure you that on this Saturday before the first Easter, before the first day of resurrection, I can assure you that they were not celebrating. The whole matter of Jesus' arrest and his crucifixion, it had brought nothing but confusion into their lives. In their minds, there was nothing to be gained here. Jesus was dead. It was over. They knew what he had taught them. They also knew that he had promised them that he would rise again on the third day, but they couldn't even begin to comprehend that he could actually do that. No one had ever done that before, not like this. So in their minds, it was impossible for them to celebrate the moment. Whenever David wrote this psalm, whenever he prayed this prayer, it was at a time that he was dedicating his house to the Lord. He asked God, would God gain anything through David's destruction? If somebody attacked and a war began to rage, if David were killed in battle, would God gain anything through David's death? And the answer on that day was no. Because the scriptures had already indicated in a few select passages that the Messiah, the Savior, would come through the lineage of David. Maybe you've asked that very question about yourself, though. Have you ever thought in those terms? Have you ever asked that same question about yourself? Would it really matter if you lived or died? Would God gain anything if I were to sink into the grave? Hmm. Remember, our focus is the Saturday before Easter. And so what is significant about the Saturday before Easter? Jesus is in the grave. That's what's significant about this day. So what can God gain if his son sinks into the tomb? Can we find an answer from anyone? Wait a minute. There is someone who took this journey with him. <laughs> he might be an unlikely source, but let's look at the scripture and let's check with him. There was one man who would joyfully travel with Jesus to that Saturday before the resurrection. The story is found in Luke chapter 23 beginning with verse 39. Notice what God's Word says. It says, One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other criminal, the other criminal rebuked him. Do you not fear God? Since we are under the same condemnation, do you not fear God since we are experiencing the same death sentence? The second criminal goes on to say, we are being punished justly for our sins. We are getting what our deeds deserve. 
But this man, this Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus answered him. Notice what Jesus said. He said, I tell you the truth. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Today, you and I are going on a journey today. It will be unlike any journey you have ever experienced. You may have had a hard life here on earth, but he told the criminal, today, you're going to experience paradise. And we're still going to be there tomorrow on Saturday. Hmm. Can you stop with me just for a moment and just celebrate the power of that incredible statement? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Today is the start of something new. Today is the start of something great. Now, whenever most people read that statement, they think it means heaven. End of story. Close the book. We're done. Well, it does mean heaven. But there is more to this story called life. And we should want to celebrate the moment. So again, the question surfaces, well, does it mean heaven or not? Bible scholars and commentaries teach us that what Jesus called paradise to the thief on the cross, godly Jews viewed paradise as being in the bosom of Abraham. It was a symbolic gesture. That might not sound too enticing to us Americans, to us Gentiles, but to the Jew, that picture meant that Adam was where, uh, that Abraham rather, was where God's covenant first began. And Abraham was their physical father or grandfather, if you would. And the statement that they were in Abraham's bosom, it simply meant God was going to keep his family together. So it was exciting to think that the family was going to stay together. Here was a man who had hung on a cross alongside of Jesus. And in his man, in his mind, he had broken all of the family virtues. He no longer deserved to be considered a part of the family. Some Bible commentaries teach that what Jesus called paradise, Paul called the third heaven. I, I don't know. But maybe, perhaps, it sure sounds nice. Other Bible scholars and commentaries teach us that what paradise is to the believer, Hades is to the unbeliever. It is a realm for the dead. But notice there's a difference. For the believer, paradise is a time when we live in excited expectation and praise while we wait for God to reveal the new heaven and the new earth at the end of the age when Jesus returns. It will be a wonderful place of overwhelming anticipation that never ends. It is the assurance that you have made heaven your home. You won't have to worry about a thing. You have made it. You have made heaven your home and the only Thing that awaits you is unending, unimaginable joy. Jesus said, today, today you will be with me in paradise. And then Saturday came. Jesus hung on the cross on that good Friday and he died. And Saturday came. What is significant about a Sabbath? It's a day of rest. Whenever God completed his act of creation after six days, on the seventh day he rested. Whenever Jesus completed that work of salvation, whenever he said it is finished, whenever he gave in and gave up the ghost 
and he died and they got him in the tomb, whenever Saturday rolled around, it was a statement that he was there in the tomb and he was resting for what was next. He was honoring God in holiness by burying the sins of the world, knowing he was going to rise again on that third day. You see, the very word Sabbath, it means rest. And it wasn't just any Sabbath. It was the most important Sabbath of the year. It was the Sabbath that fell between the celebration of the Passover supper and the celebration of the harvest of first fruits. That year on Friday, Jesus was the Passover lamb when he was crucified for our sins. That year on Sunday, he was the first fruit, or he was the first one to ever be harvested or resurrected from the grave. You see, Lazarus was resuscitated by Jesus. He was, the only, he was only the first one to be resurrected by God from the grave. But on that day in between, he rested. He had said, it is finished, and so he rested. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, the scripture says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. They will rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Their works follow them. Here we are 2,000 years later celebrating the works of Jesus Christ. Celebrating his gospel. Many of you know that my father passed away this past November. We've ordered his tombstone and we're anxious for it to come in. It'll be ready soon. On his tombstone will be his name. James Hughes Trotter. And then beneath that, there will be the date of his birth and a dash in between and then the day of his death. I think about my dad every day. But I don't suffer by thinking about him. I don't live in sorrow thinking about dad. And the reason I don't is because of the dash. I know that he lived his life within the dash. I know how he lived his life within the, within the dash. He lived from 1932 dash to 2019. But all of my experiences with him took place within the dash. Right now, I'm living in my dash and you are living within yours. Our birth nor our death tells the true story about our lives. It's the dash that's in between. The true story of our life is living, is living within the dash. So today, while you are living in the dash, let me ask you a few questions. In your walk with Jesus Christ, do you know how to celebrate the moment? Can you celebrate that paradise with Jesus is waiting for you? Paradise. Can you celebrate the Sabbath and remain at rest with Jesus? No guilt, no heavy baggage hanging over you? Are you celebrating today and testifying about the Lord within your dash. You see, you only have one life to live. And that means you only have one life to give. How will you live within the dash today? Father God, I pray that as we take inventory of our hearts and our lives right now, speak to us. 
Help us, dear Lord, to take advantage of our time within the dash. Help us to make a difference that will mean something when we're all together in eternity. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day of rest. Thank you for the journey that you gave the thief, the criminal, to your paradise. Grace he didn't deserve, but grace you freely offered because of his confession and repentance. Help us to give you ourselves as well. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, I pray.